speakers, so Stephen Moran of the University of Zurich and Ethan Grossman of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, will be talking about temporal bias, a new kind of bias for typologists to worry about. All right, so first of all, thanks very much. It's really great to be here. Um, I should say that Steve is actually now from the University of Neuchatel, but um, back in the day when we applied for UBL uh, two years ago, he was still at the University of Zurich. So it's uh, very nice to be here, and in particular, it's a pleasure to follow up on um, Balthazar Bickel's talk the other day because he really said everything that I thought should be said, and so we're in the pleasant position of being able to build on that. So I'm going to take as my point of departure, rather than something that I have to uh, prove per se, is the idea that present-day distributions of linguistic properties might conceal really substantive evolutionary changes in human language. And these changes might have occurred even in the relatively recent past. And the point that we'd like to make here is very similar to the one that Balthazar made in his talk, that linguists should be very cautious about making inferences about language with a capital L that are read off directly from present day distributions. Now, what do I mean? Um, let's look at just a map. It's from taken from the World Atlas of Language Structures. What we do see here are some cross linguistically rare sounds like front rounded vowels, labiovelar plosives or clicks. Any um, linguist who is trained to think in a kind of classical way would assume that there's something maybe not terribly good about these sounds. They're not very good at surviving. They're not very good at arising or conventionalizing or something like this. On the other hand, when we look at lax, so languages that don't have fricatives, bilabials or nasals, again, uh, Ian Madison's work from World well, Atlas of Language Structures, we might think that these are sounds which are so awesome that no self-respecting language would like to do without them. And these are very reasonable things to think. Um, but let's delve a little bit deeper into that, just looking at frequency distributions. So if we look at um, the two um, uh, labiodental fricatives, f and v, they're among the most frequent uh, phonemes in the world's languages. So f is around the 21st most frequent segment in the world's languages, v is around the 33rd. And if we look just as consonants, they're even more uh, frequent. So it's very natural to think that these sounds are unmarked in some way, that um, they're just, you know, belong to language with a capital L and so on. Um, but in fact, it was recently shown by uh, Damian Blasi et al. in 2019 that labiodentals are very late in human evolution. And in fact, they postdate the advent and spread of agriculture several thousand years ago. So if we were going to look at the distribution of uh, uh, phonological segments, Several thousand years ago, we would see a radically different picture with regard to labiodentals. Now, this might not seem terribly exciting or, or, or bothersome, but if you think about it more deeply, it can be. So again, it would be nice um, for linguists um, if we could just read off sort of the cognitive or communicative or biological goodness or naturalness mm -hmm. of a linguistic type um, from the empirical frequency of the type in a given distribution. And it might actually be the case that's valid, but that depends on what's called the uniformitarian principle. Now, the uniformitarian principle is well known from historical linguistics and sociolinguistics. It's been interpreted in lots of ways, but I don't actually want any of these nuanced versions. I want the straw man version, which I think actually a lot of linguists uh, adhere to, which is, and we call this the implicit uniformitarian assumption that human languages have always been pretty much the same in terms of the typological distribution of the units that compose them. That's um, a citation from Neumeyer, who doesn't actually endorse this point of view per se. Um, and um, the idea here is that throughout the history of whatever it is that we call human language, cross-linguistic distributions of linguistic properties, whether simple or complex, phonological, semantic, lexical, syntactic, whatever you want, have been more or less the same. So if we look at um, today's distributions and something is rare, we can project backwards into the past and say, well, that must have always been uh, rare. And this is the kind of thinking that enables us to read off things about human cognition and communication and so on from present day distributions. So the idea in this assumption is that cross-linguistic distributions are time independent. But there's a lot of reasons for skepticism about this position. First of all, as Balthazar said, there's a very small number of top level families, many of which, many of which are isolates. Um, also language contact makes languages in the same area very similar in pretty much every possible respect. And that scales up to continent size areas and beyond. Um, and as uh, Pianta Dosin Gibson pointed out a few years ago, uh, the number of present day language families and areas doesn't really give us enough 
independent data points to infer universal properties of languages based on the current sample that we have, right? Um, so when we look at present day distributions, we have to acknowledge that to, to some extent, artifacts of inheritance and historical events like language spread and contact. But also there are other reasons for skepticism. So non-linguistic factors can shape language structures in ways that influence cross-linguistic distributions. And I'll just mention things like speech community size, other aspects of demography, genes, geography, other environmental factors, technology, and even uh, cultural mores might end up influencing uh, linguistic structures in ways that impact cross-linguistic distributions in the relatively short term. Um, and I took this from uh, Balthazar's slide. He was nice enough to send it to me. Another reason is that given any particular distribution, so if we look at this uh, red and blue on the left, these dots, these are, let's say, values for any particular linguistic property, let's say, being uh, object initial or object final or whatever it is, given this present day distribution, we don't actually know what the evolutionary pathways were that led to this, right? And that's what we see from all of these nice uh, trees. So um, Balthazar said, he didn't write this in his slides, what we have is a degenerate sample of linguistic diversity, uh, possibly reflecting post-Neolithic population history rather than language with a capital L. And his conclusions were that we should forget post hoc generalizations and expand based on present day cross linguistic distributions and rather focus on mechanisms to which I expand of change and the causal factors or triggers that bias transition probabilities in one direction or another. All right. So now I'm going to turn to a brief story. Um, my colleagues and I, uh, Steve, Dimitri, and El Ad, who um, uh, you heard a few days ago, were interested in. Uh, asking whether phonological systems have changed substantively in the past few thousand years. And we wanted to do this on an empirical basis. So look at the distribution of speech sounds in present day and ancient or reconstructed languages. And we have the relative, relevant databases. So one is Foible uh, and the other one is BD Proto. So Foible is a big repository of cross-linguistic uh, phonological inventories. It's huge. It's currently the largest one out there. And BD Proto is an old database that um, was transformed largely by Steve and also added to um, uh, in recent years. Um, and these are phonological inventories from ancient and reconstructed languages, right? So as it were, it would be nice if we could simply compare these two distributions and see what the differences are. But we also wanted to see to what extent recent language contacts, so borrowing events, uh, shaped present day distributions based on SEGBO. Those of you who are in Dimitri and Elad's talk uh, will have heard about this. But we realized that there's a data problem when we want to compare present day and past distribution of linguistic properties of any sort. We're going to be talking about sounds, but um, it's really, it's relevant for anything. So I have to back up just a moment and talk about sampling and typology. So I know there's a usage-based uh, linguistics conference and not everyone are typologists, so this I hope is not um, too basic. So the traditional goal of Greenbergian typology is to look for universals of language, what Baltes are called post hoc generalizations, and to explain them. And since there are many ways in which languages can be non-independent data points, typologists have typically resorted to sampling and most typically what linguists have tried to do is to create maximally stratified language samples, right? So trying to um, kind of uh, get confounds out of the way. So the well-known ones are genealogical bias. So languages from the same family can be similar uh, for that simple reason of inheritance. Ge geographical bias, languages in the same area tend to influence each other. Typological bias. So you don't want to make a sample that's just SOV languages because that might have lots of uh, downstream consequences and other things have been proposed as well. Um, and we wanted to point to uh, what we think hasn't really been pointed out yet, uh, or if it has not, it's not prominent in the literature, something we call the temporal bias. Now, temporal bias is a set of problems that complicate the empirical study of cross-linguistic distributions in the past. And it basically stems from the fact that as each language exists in space, it also exists at a particular time. And the main effect of this bias is to compound already existing problems of data sparsity, right? So this problem of having enough um, independent data points. So this is based on an article that we wrote a couple of years with Anna-Marie Fulkelk, okay? Um, now, what do I mean? Here on the left, we have uh, a full Indo-European tree. We didn't mention all of the leaves, which languages we're talking about. 
And on the right, we have a pruned tree, which is all of the existing data points that we have in Foible. So this is a very kind of um, trivial kind of data sparsity, right? We don't necessarily have in our databases coverage for all the languages that we know about, but we're actually trying to point to something a little bit more complicated, which is the further left we go in these trees or the further into the past we go, we have fewer and fewer data points that are conceivably available to us that we can know about, right? So this is relevant both in terms of sheer chronology, right? The amount of number of years that have passed, the further we go into the past, the, few, the, few, for the fewer data points we have, but it's also true in, in phylogenetic time, right? So the further back we go, the, 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 we have the more pot, the, the sparser the data is in terms of, you know, the nodes and, um, and um, you know, the, the genealogical stuff. Um, and this is just the same thing that we see from Austronesian, but with lots more languages and nodes. So um, the first part of temporal bias we call the chronological bias. So let's say you want to compare past and present distributions. You're going to end up with a database if you want to have any number of data points that's going to include things like early modern English, classical Latin, Proto-Germanic, Old Egyptian, Proto-Dravidian. And these are from radically different um, times in the past and they're also very different in terms of where they are phylogenetically. We'll get that to a, to a minute. But for each point in time, our data are increasingly sparse, right? When we go back to, I don't know, 5,000 years before present, then we, we obviously have um, very few data points. Um, similarly, um, is the issue of phylogenetic depth. So language families are very heterogeneous in terms of their size and diversification. So one family or one stock might have many nodes like Indo-European, but it could have very few like Japonic or Basque which means that when we're comparing ancient and reconstructed languages, it's, it might be like comparing the branches of the angel oak tree on the left, um, which branches low very early, its branches kind of come back into the ground with those of birch trees, which are very like, you know, straight and they only tend to bifurcate up toward the, towards the top. So if we wanted to study um, distribution of linguistic properties in the past um, for particular periods, we would either need to eliminate nodes from the more diversified families like Austronesian or Indo-European, or inflate the genealogical complexity of the less diversified families like Japonic or Basque. And again, these would exacerbate the already acute problem of data sparsity, right? So this is a kind of inherent problem that we're dealing with when we want to talk about um, pre-modern or, 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 or past distributions in some kind of empirical way. So how can we mitigate or avoid temporal bias um, well, the answer is not found in better sampling techniques because then we're going to end up just having extremely sparse data. But rather, as, as Balthazar suggested, by focusing on mechanisms or more broadly, the dynamics of change themselves, by which I also include um, the causal triggers and all of the cognitive, communicative, social, environmental, whatever factors that end up biasing change in one direction or another. Right? So we're going to take a brief case study. Um, which is the evolutionary rates of consonants and vowels. Um, Egidio Marsico, in his study, he was the father of B.D. Proto. He made this for his PhD in the 90s. Um, he, going back 10,000 years ago, he found that languages are phonologically about as complex as present day languages, which is nice for the uniformitarian hypothesis. But we might actually, because of the way that, that languages are reconstructed, we might expect reconstructed sound systems to actually be more complex than their daughter languages. And this has to do with particularities of the comparative method. And you can ask me about this if you want. Interestingly, modern languages have, tend to have more consonants than their ancestors did. And this is a kind of surprising result. Um, so the question that um, was set out to answer is, you know, why is it that we see more consonants in phonological inventories in uh, today than we do in ancient languages, right? So this is a, a test was made of eight language families, big and ancient ones, with um, to see whether you know wh which families show greater rates of change in either consonants or vowels, um, and this was done using um, contemporary phylogenetic comparative methods. So these are the families. It's not terribly important right now. Um, so what was done was to determine the number of composition of consonants and vowels in each phonological inventory from Foible and BD Proto. Um, here we have Foible. You can see the numbers are a little bit lower than what are currently there because the study was uh, done on older versions of both databases. Right, so this is the coverage. 
This is the coverage of, a part of the coverage of BB Proto with some uh, expert estimates of the age of uh, these families. All right, and this is what uh, the basic data looks like. So we have here a uh, expert generated phylogenetic tree. We have each language as a leaf and the number of vowels and consonants. And then um, we use standard computational phylogenetic analysis techniques and uh, what we ended up finding is the rates of change per thousand years um, in consonants and vowels in these uh, different families, right? So this is one visualization, um, and this is another. So what we see here is the ranges of the numbers of vowels and consonants. And the important thing here is for you to see that there's an asterisk in each one next to either C or V, and that's the one that showed a greater rate of change um, over time. So. Um, the first thing that we see based on this is that there's no universal pathway. Um, we find differential rates of change um, in both consonant and vowel inventories in different families. So in some families, consonants change more rapidly, in other ones, it's vowels. And in either case, the rates can differ quite, quite, con quite considerably. And this is in contrast to the null hypothesis, which is there's just no relationship between being this kind of family or another kind of family and rates of change. So this is not in itself super surprising because this is in line with pre previous work on rates of change and typological stability, which we already know something about. Um, there's some rather famous studies like uh, Greenhill and et al. and so on. Um, and one of the results is that we just can't assume uniform rates of change across all languages in all areas of grammar, right? So this seems to be pretty accepted today and shouldn't be very surprising. Um, but I'd like to, again, focus on these findings. So one is family-specific rates of change. And also, and interestingly, each family changes in a particular direction, which is to say there's no unbiased families. Now, uh, Bickel in 2013 proposed something called the family bias method, which is essentially looking, in order to identify um, dynamics of change, looking at phylogenetic units, families, and trying to determine um, you know, uh, directionality of change and um, and to see whether we have um, the same degree and, and, and directionality of change across families. And so his interpretation of a situation like ours, which um, is again to say family specific rates of change, so each family is doing its own thing, but each family changes directionally, so there's no unbiased families, is that we see here the operation of universal pressures um, leading to preferred pathways or directions of change. And we can also see in these cases, the relative strengths of these pressures. So our findings provide some kind of preliminary evidence for pressures that lead to the expansion of consonant inventories on the one hand, and pressures that lead to the expansion of vowel inventories on the other. And these pressures must be relatively strong since again, we didn't find any unbiased families in our sample. But on the other hand, it's hard to say which is stronger um, because the respective proportions in our sample are small in any way it's a small sample. So I, you know, we wouldn't attribute too much to this. Now, what might these pressures be? And here I have to say, we didn't actually go and test this. I'm just saying what could lead to this. These are um, theories, uh, predictive theories that one could check. So one is the differential functional load of vowels and consonants in maintaining lexical distinctions. This might possibly favor higher rates of change in vowels if we follow kind of classical work by Martinet. Um, but it also might be related to differential borrowability of vowels and consonants, which would favor higher rates of change in consonants. And this we can say for sure now. But it also might be the number and type of dimensions through which vowel systems and consonant systems expand because vowel inventories tend to grow more economically than consonant inventories. But other pressures might be language external, so sociocultural, environmental, biological, or what have you. Now, um, in case you were wondering uh, what I mentioned earlier about um, the extent to which phonological inventories have changed in recent years, the answer is yes. Um, phonological inventories have indeed changed substantially over the past few millennia. And interestingly, the segments whose distribution changed the most correlate strongly with the most frequently borrowed uh, segments in Segbo. Um, and this points to the possible role of recent language spreads in shaping phonological inventories worldwide. 
So in this respect, we don't really see any support for the implicit uniformitarian assumption, again, being that um, cross-linguistic distributions are time independent, right? So um, here are the conclusions. Um, we can't simply assume that the distribution of linguistic properties um, in the past is identical to present day distributions. Um, that means we can't simply read off things about cognition, communication, biology, and so on from present day distributions, a point again made forcefully by Balthazar Bickel in this talk. It means that we have to care about temporal bias when actually looking into distributions in the past. And the way forward is dense samples, not stratified samples, better statistical methods, and again, targeting mechanisms and causes of change. So thank you for listening. These are our email addresses, and uh, these are the repositories where you can find the uh, various stuff that we've been talking about. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. And I see Dorit is already raising her virtual hand. Dorit? Uh, yeah, I, I have two questions. I hope I will remember them by the, by the time I finish saying what I have to say. So where does this uniformist or whatever hypothesis come from? And the second question, just so I'll remember it, you said something about a hypothesis that the phonological inventories of languages tend to be richer than those of their daughters. Yeah. And you said to ask you, so I'm asking. Yeah. All right, so, um, okay, so the first question is uniformitarian hypothesis. The standard story about this is this comes to us from geology. It was an assumption that was made by geologists. And again, it relates to the idea that um, the world might have been physically different in the past, but that the laws of physics and in particular laws of change um, the regularities of change should not have been different at any point in the past. Um, so this allows for different states to exist while saying that there's something really universal about the laws that govern the world. Um, as for the second question, the reason that we, we often expect reconstructed languages to be a little bit inflated is that the way that historical linguists reach um, phonological inventories is through a method called the comparative method. Now, it's often the case that we find correspondence sets, which is our kind of bread and butter, that end up uh, leading us to the need for positing a phoneme um, that really isn't, uh, you know, well reflected in the daughter languages, for example. It's kind of the result of the way that distributions work. So, it's, so this has been shown for Indo-European that many reconstructions are probably richer than, uh, or necessarily justified and certainly uh, more than their daughter languages. I see that Danny is also raising his hand. Yes, uh, thanks, Aitan. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I have two questions. One of them is related to Dorit's question. But ask uh, only one, Danny, because we're gone a little over. No, is, is it okay? No, as you said, you have two questions. I said ask just one. Okay, just one. Uh, the, my question is this. Uh, could we perhaps assume that uh, physiologic the physiology of the human being has changed and therefore uh, in the past uh, human beings were capable of producing more consonants than they are today or something of that sort might have happened in the evolution of the human uh, humankind. Thank you. This is a beautiful question and one that actually people pray, might not have dared to ask um, not too long ago, but this is, I really recommend looking at this paper that I mentioned by Blasi et al. Steve was also first co-author on this. And the argument there is that actually um, there have been changes in human physiology as a result of changes in human diet, which stem from uh, the advent of spread of agriculture. Um, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't like to go into the details right now, but it's, it's very easily available online. Um, now, people have been looking into this, not only um, the differences between present day and pre-present day human beings, but also people now have been looking more into kind of biological variability in um, the speech physiology in present day human populations. And of course, you know, this is the kind of thing that was, might've been seem a, a little bit, um, yeah, like race science uh, in the past. And people are kind of gently going back to this now. 